happy. And um, there we go. Thank That's you very right. much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And but just be aware that we are recording, so um, comments and and things will be recorded. Um, I think that is it. Now I will um, hand over to Professor Keen. I'll also hand over admin duties to Eric Weinhocker. So if anyone's got any questions or or needs a, a, a question, you can use your hand or message in the chat. And um, thank you very much, Professor, for joining us. Thank you all. Well, thank you for the invitation as well. And Matthew was being an old student of mine from my early days of being an academic at the uh, University of New South Wales, which is quite a quite a long link. OK, so what I'm talking about today, as I've first said in the profile, is correcting the economic blind spot on energy. And uh, this is something I only got into after I had, in, in my way of thinking, solved that particular blind spot. But then I looked at the work of neoclassical economists on climate change. And I was stunned uh, when I first saw it, uh, simply for the numbers they were talking about. So this is actually just showing this, this has not changed over the 40 years or so of neoclassical work on climate change. This is the latest IPCC report. And there they're saying warming of four degrees Celsius will cause between a, a 10 to 23% fall in GDP compared to what it would have been if there'd been no global warming. So that's, a 23% fall is actually, from an economic point of view, a large estimate of the fall. These are three papers from 2021 uh, with Chris Hope, who's uh, responsible for one of the more uh, pop, you know, dominant IAMs. 3.67% losses, that is a direct quote, 3.67%, two, two decimal places of accuracy from a four degree increase in temperature by 2100. Uh, Khan and Mahadi's came out and they, they said a 7% fall with 3.2 degrees above today, which is about 4.5 over pre-industrial. And then a, a recent paper again by Dietz, uh, Rising, Stock and Wagner saying that tipping points, and these are, the tipping points included uh, releasing the um, ocean methane hydrates, as well as losing uh, the West Antarctic, losing Greenland, losing AMOC, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. They'll reduce consumption by 1.4% uh, at six degrees of warming. Now, if you look at scientists, you find that you won't even see a number above two degrees being discussed as even feasible, even worth discussing. This is Stefan and Co. Quite a large group of authors saying there's a two. The, their estimate is at two degrees, everything changes. We're in a totally different environment. You don't want to risk two degrees. And sometime before that, Hansen made the same point. Two degrees global warming could be dangerous. Not, uh, you know, if you, if not what the economists are talking about with four to six degrees, but two degrees being dangerous. So why do they get such different numbers? Well, the reason is they've effectively made up their own data. They have not used the data from scientists. And the, the beginning of this was Nordhaus back in 1991, simply assuming that 87% of industry would be unaffected by climate change. That included all of manufacturing, mining, he was obviously ignoring out, uh, out uh, uh, open cut mining, utilities, finance, trade, and most service. It was very difficult to find any major direct impact on those industries over the next 50 to 75 years. And the same assumption, you might think that was obviously a crazy assumption in the early days, no, in 2014, the IPCC came out with the same thing as a frequently asked question. They said, other economic activities such as manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments and are not really exposed to climate change. In other words, a roof is all you need to protect yourself from climate change. Now, the, this is sheer ignorance, no other way to describe it. And the, one of the, the important points of ignorance is an obvious major direct impact is whether energy is going to be available. But they can't even answer the question, and I'm going to say they because I'm clearly not a neoclassical economist, and this is work of neoclassical economists. So to me, they're the outs I'm the outsider to them. Energy is not an input in the standard Cobb-Douglas production function. So the usual story is technology times capital times labor in a, a constant returns to scale equation. So energy doesn't turn up at all. Uh, and the exponent alpha, for, and we're telling you, you know, this is telling you all to suck eggs, of course. Most of you, I imagine, would know the Cobb Douglas system backwards, but it's based on the income share of capital of roughly 30%. Now, when you do have energy incorporated, as Stiglitz and Solo did back in 1974, they'll whack on energy or resources as the third factor. 
and they will give that also an income shared base exponent. So just taking a recent paper, again, in this neoclassical um, climate change tradition, the exponent for energy is set to 0 0.03, which is roughly the share of energy in GDP. And if you have that tiny exponent, you're going to predict a tiny impact from a fall in energy input. So if you have, for example, an 80% fall in available energy with that exponent, the prediction is that there'll be a 5% fall in GDP. So 80% fall in energy, we substitute labor and capital and our output falls by a mere 5%. Now, mind you, my engagement in this literature was came out of literally this um, just inspiration occurring to me one day. The whole idea of labor and capital producing our energy without energy is crazy. Labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. And what that means is energy is not an independent factor of production on the same scale as capital and labor, but it's an input to capital and labor without which they can do no work. So rather than having uh, GDP being a fact of output of three factors of production, it's a factor of two where they both require energy as an input. And so when you put that into um, this framework, rather than saying capital times labor times energy where the exponents sum to one, it's capital with energy at time t as an argument raised to alpha and labor uh, with energy as an argument to it into itself raised to one minus alpha. Now, the simplest way to handle what capital and labor are are the units K and L, the energy input per unit of K and L. So the food we consume for our and, and everything else we consume in terms of energy is our inputs the inputs to a machine is ek and then little e l and k the efficiency with which that energy is turned into useful work so and of course that's between zero and one now when you think about the energy that we put in we consume far more energy than a roman slave did but in terms of calories we actually put into work we can put in no more energy than a Roman slave did. So if you combine the energy we consume times the fraction of that that is put into production, it's roughly constant, roughly equal to 100 watts or less per hour. Whereas on the other hand, the energy going into a machine has been growing exponentially ever since the James Watt steam engine was first, uh, first invented or first designed. Uh, James Watt's engine used to consume nine tons of coal per day. I've just watched another Falcon 9 rocket launch where that rocket is consuming nine tons per second. So the enormous increase in the energy throughput of machinery. So when you put this together, you get an energy aware Cobb Douglas production function, and that's la the, the capital lambda, which is the energy, the coefficient for um, constant coefficient for labor times the energy input in machinery raised to the alpha. Now that means alpha replaces new as the exponent of energy, well alpha is 10 times new. So when you look at it, what you get is a the, the standard Cobb Douglas production function, the way it's handled drastically understates the impact of energy. And now when you put in uh, the argument that I've got, because alpha is now 0.3 rather than new being is 0.03, an 80% fall in energy now predicts a 38% fall in output. Now we're talking a significant number, but even that's not large enough. And there's an excellent paper by ManQ from 1995, there's two papers in the series, 92 and 95, where he argues that if you want to fit the Cobb Douglas production function to cross country data, not in country now, but comparing countries together. The only way it makes sense is if alpha is much, much larger. And he finally comes down and says, you can solve all the empirical problems he identifies with the standard Cobb Douglas if you set alpha equal to 0 0.8. So not 0 0.03, not 0 0.3, 0 0.8. And you put that into the standard equation, Notice how you're getting almost a straight line now for your Cobb Douglas production function, an 80% fall in energy with these coefficients that make sense of a international comparative data predicts a 72% fall in output. Now, let's bring Ockham's razor in here. If you have an 80% fall in energy and 72% fall in output, it's almost a straight line. It's almost the Leonti of expression. What's the point of Cobb Douglas, which is much more complicated? when Leontiev fits the data almost as well, in fact, fits it better, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, the Leontiev is normally shown in terms of a minimum capital output or labor output ratio. I prefer to use it as a, as a, a capacity utilization figure 
uh, times the capital input and then labor is derived from that. And if you do the replacement for that I've just done with the Cobb Douglas and do the same K times ZK times ZK for uh, the uh, Leontief, what you get is an energy perception of production where production is transforming energy into useful work. And I now want to map that back to the, the widget version. If you think about the standard production function, we're talking in this disembodied unit of you know, a single commodity model, uh, it's effectively widgets per year. Well, the widgets per year are equal to the energy per year divided by the energy content of the average widget. And when you do this comparison and link the two equations together, the standard Leontief form, and what are now providing, proposing in terms of an energy-based form, if you equate terms with the same dimensions, you find your EY is actually the energy consumption of a representative machine, whereas the EK is, is the inverse of the capital output ratio. Now, that was just an arbitrary constant that appeared to fit the data when Leontief first put it forward. What I'm showing here is that it is actually the inverse of the efficiency with which machinery turks energy into useful work. So there's your revised Leontier production function. Output, output in widget terms is capacity utilization times capital times the efficiency with which capital turns its inputs into useful work. And what you get is a linear relationship between GDP and energy, and also you get waste. This also applies in the Cobb Douglas production firm as well. If Y is your output in, in production terms, then with, with EK being the term, then one minus EK, where one minus EK will be greater than EK, effectively given the second law of thermodynamics, that's your waste production. So production necessarily involves waste. And when you look at the uh, result, that's what you get, a one-to-one -one relationship. 80% fall in energy will give you an 80% fall in output. And that's therefore energy matters. This is what can be a very direct impact upon production. Uh, in the next 50 to 75 years, despite Nordhaus's inability to think of what those effects might be. And when you look at the data, the data strongly confirms the idea of a one-to-one -one relationship between energy and GDP. You can see the, the tightness of the fit there, but of course, those are both increasing functions. Maybe that's part to do it. But when you then look at the change in energy and the change in GDP, annual data, global level, the correlation coefficient is 0.83. And notice it's almost one to one. I've used exactly the same scale for change in energy and change in GDP. So that supports the idea that energy, G GDP is effectively the transformation of energy into useful work, whether that work takes the form of energy or widgets. Now, why did I use an 80% decline figure? That's because if we are suddenly forced to stop producing fossil fuels by absolutely unarguable climate catastrophes, then we could have an 80% fall in GDP because less than 20% of our energy comes from renewable resources. So this is the data on renewable, non-carbon based energy sources as a fraction of total energy. It was not even 14% in 2017. It might be, um, it might be 20% now if we're lucky, but that means 80% of our energy is coming from fossil fuels. So we're forced to stop using them. That's the sort of plunge we'll see in the output of those sectors. So that's why the neoclassical got it totally wrong. How do we get it totally right? And what I want to show is you can use the, you end up, you don't just use the Goodwin model. The Goodwin model drops naturally out of an energy-based approach working for macroeconomic definitions. Now the Goodwin model has been wrongly criticized empirically by a paper by Harvey, and Harvey was good enough to admit in conversation with me that he made a mistake. Literally, he had percentages and he should have had fractions. At one point in the paper that was published, I think back in 2000 and, um, oh, I think it's in the 1990s, I think, on 2000, pardon me, where he said the model didn't fit the data. It does fit the data. And this has been done by Griselli and Mashuari showing that uh, the Gooden model is quite a reasonable fit to the averages of the data for the OECD. Now, Goodwin's model is hard to understand because Goodwin's derivation was, was both brilliant and obscure. So I wanna show you can actually derive Goodwin's model directly from macroeconomic definitions while using the Leontier production function, which is one reason why I went through the details of showing why the Leontier fits the data. So if you start from the employment rate, 
and the wages share of GDP, and you combine that with an out, 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 cap, output to employment ratio and a capital to output ratio, convert those into differential equations, you can then show that the rate of change of the employment rate is the rate of change of labour minus the rate of change of population, et cetera, et cetera. If I add in other standard assumptions from a, a post-Keynesian point of view, so a constant capital output ratio, a uniform wage rate, exogenous technical change and population growth, what you get, and it's very simple to derive this, you get a relationship in terms of the rate of change of the employment rate is the growth rate minus labour productivity ch change minus population growth, whereas the wages share is, labor, is the rate of change of wages minus the change in the labour to output ratio. And it's also quite easy to derive the rate of change of the GDP, that's the same as the rate of change of capital with the assumption of a constant capital output ratio. When you make the simplifying assumption that Goodwin did of all profits being invested, uh, you re very rapidly derive a uh, relationship for the rate of change of employment, which is the profit share divided by the output, the, the, the uh, capital output ratio minus the sum of labour productivity, so-called uh, population change and depreciation. Now, again, it's very easy to divide. You have a, a linear Phillips curve and you get a very simple model, but that model in differential equation forms is shown over here. And what you get out of it is cyclical growth. So I could simulate Ned and Minsky, but given time constraints, I'll leave that uh, to later in the presentation. So now what I want to do is convert it across to energy. So I'm now using widgets, being able to energy output per year divided by the that energy per widget component. And I find I have to derive a different ratio for the labor productivity point of view. I've got the rate of change of labor uh, component being the sum of two changes, the change in the energy throughput per machine and the change in the number of machines. And I've, I realize I'm running very tight on time here, so I'm gonna go a bit faster. Um, I can, this is all, all basically show the logic is fairly straightforward to derive. So I can then derive the employment rate of change of the employment rate, um, deriving uh, the, the output in terms of energy, again, as a case of expanding those, uh, those components of the energy expression. And I finally have, after I do a few more manipulations, I end up with exactly the same structure as the original Goodwin model. The difference is now that rather than having V, the capital output ratio, a bucket EK, which is the efficiency with which machinery turns energy into useful work, multiplying the rate of the rate of investment. So that looks like I've got, you know, got nowhere quickly. But what I want to show is that because I now have a tie-up with energy, I also have a tie-up with waste, and I have a tie-up with energy depreciate. Uh, de 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 depletion. So just to quickly show this, and this is now showing it in a flowchart format as well. If I now simulate this in my Minsky system dynamic software, then I can, because I now have in, uh, resource inputs as a necessary part of the model and also have waste, then I can get those two elements of reality in there as well. So we no longer have the environment as an as a externality. The, the economy is is internal to the environment, we can deplete the resources, and we can generate waste that overwhelms our productive system as well. And what were the consistent, never changing cycles of the Goodwin model when you start depleting your resources, or when your waste feeds back on your system, leads to a cyclical collapse. And I'll just let that run through in the phase diagram over there on the on the far right hand side. So uh, this may be where we're headed. So let's just go back to, pardon me, I've got to go back to my presentation. Okay. Now that's just the warm up because, of course, it, we don't just have energy in input, we have energy in matter. So what I had to do was work out a way of modeling a single commodity world where there are multiple resource inputs and where energy is vital. And you can't use corn in this situation because corn is not really manufactured, it makes itself. So the first person to attempt to build a model. Uh, a dynamic model with inputs of the labor and capital and other inputs producing output was actually John Hicks in 1935, before he read Keynes. 
And that's where ISLM came from. I'll just leave that comment there, but this is why making one little side point. The ISLM model is not a Keynesian model. It's a neoclassical general equilibrium model with a three market system. But what he was trying to do, which was a very worthy game, was to build a, a one commodity model of production, which was dynamic. So he started by assuming that there was a single homogenous good that the communities involved in producing, which we shall call bread, which is an obvious choice to make. And he said, bread is made by labor with capital, where labor is homogenous and capital is not homogenous. So we call the capital equipment. I mean, land, building, machinery, raw materials, half finished goods, et cetera, et cetera. And we start with a certain amount of equipment. So where does the equipment come from? And a certain stock of finished bread. But the unsolved dilemma he never managed to solve was how do you make equipment out of bread? Of course, you can't. And what he actually ended up saying, and this, this is a quote from the paper, obviously, uh, it will either get bread which you produce today for the market the next market day, or in the production of bread for the more distant future, activity which a week after will have only resulted in the production of equipment. Now, how do you turn stale bread into machinery? Okay, so he effectively gave up and he gave us the ISLM model instead, which is an enormous tragedy in the history of economic thought. Um, and, but I, I must admit, when I first attempted to do what I'm showing you here now, I really felt for Hicks. I've got a lot of respect for him over time. He became a post-Keynesian, as most of you are probably aware of in this seminar. But what he did was he started with the realistic consumer good, which is bread. But how do you make that into an investment good? Stale bread makes bread? It doesn't make sense. Um, so what occurred to me was, how about having an unrealistic consumer good, but a realistic investment good? And then that reminded me of a little movie called The Iron Giant, a brilliant animated movie from the early, I think, 2000. And the idea was that there was a planet, of, we mentioned that there was a planet of the iron giants where the consumption good is iron. And you eat, the workers eat the iron, but you also, iron's the investment good, and you can turn it into, you've got energy and, and coal, iron ore and coal are necessary to produce it. Uh, and you can make it into blast furnaces, rolling mills, iron ore mining equipment, coal mining equipment, and so on. So that, that made sense in this abstract world. So you have two non-produced inputs, iron ore, which is the matter, and coal, which is the energy, and also a transforming chemical. Your production process combines iron ore and coal, which is energy as well, in a furnace to produce iron ore and slag. So you now have three production relationships, energy, mining, and a factory. And they each have a different type of output. So you actually have four outputs, energy, iron ore, iron and slag, and also waste energy. So each of these requires energy and capital and labor as an input. So you have three yields in each of the three key production systems, energy yielding energy, energy yielding mining output, and energy yielding factory output, where that actor is both iron and slag. So what you now have is a, a set of equations for the transformation of these inputs into outputs, energy, matter, and the output of the factory, where half of it or part of it is iron, but the other part is slag. So what that meant was, and this is something we had, I had an interesting discussion with over with my co-authors on this, Matthias Griselli and uh, Tim Garrett. They wanted me to continue using widgets. And I said, no, I think the only way to measure this is in capital and output are measured in tons of iron. So my unit of measurement, which is obviously, this goes to, to Schraffer's dilemma, everything is measured in terms of iron. So there's total capital stock, which is the number of machines times the weight of each machine, all measured in tons of iron or kilograms of iron and so on. So you can now derive a set of factors of the fraction of total capital that's involved in a particular industry. And then you have a label to capital ratio because there's a, a set number of workers per machine. So you can therefore divide an aggregate labor to output ratio, which comes out of adding all these sums together. You get employment related to the level of capital as well as to the population. And you could therefore have an aggregate wage setting function. So I'm back in a Phillips curve world once more. And the, the, the pro problem we face, this is obviously a, a temporary solution. How do you relate the output of one sector to another? Now, what you'd normally have is price dynamics and, and physical buffers. But as a first pass, we assume that energy and minerals output adjust to the need of the factory sector. So that means there's the, there's the energy output of the energy sector. 
and that's got to be equal to the consumption of energy in the other three in all in all, all three sectors. And therefore, the yield has to adjust to the needs of the other sectors. So here's now an expression for the yield of the needs of desire, the required yield of the energy sector. So you work that out, and you now have a new parameter for um, energy production. Now, how do you solve the next one is why and how do you solve that? Conservation of matter turns up because the matter coming in from the mining sector will be converted into either iron or slag, and the sum of the iron and slag in, in kilos will equal the sum of the inputs. So I'm, I know this is fairly heavy uh, detail, but I'll, I'll go through rapidly. We can hopefully have a conversation about it at the end there. So there's your output in terms of mining of kilos, and there's the output of the factory in kilos as well. And when you solve, solve for the yield of the factory, you then find that the yield of the manufacturing um, sector is, is if the mining sector is part of the <coughs> equation for the output of the factory sector. So you now have expressions both for output in terms of actual goods, which is Y, and outputs in waste, which is YW. So now you can complete the model, and I've left the rest of the completion there. That's an embedded PDF. So if you click on the file, you'll get the PDF there. And now when I simulate it, and this is one of the, the fun things that can happen when you first build a model like this, when I built it, I just used arbitrary numbers for all the uh, um, uh, parameters. And I saw this happening and my heart sank because I thought, oh shit, it's gone to zero. I've got, there must be an error in the model. And then I looked and said, hang on a sec. The, um, the red one, which is wages share of GDP has gone to zero or very almost zero, but employment is rising. Let's wait and see what happens. So I waited and waited and waited. And then we got past a certain level of the employment rate hitting about 61% employment right now, 62% coming up, 63, and okay, come on, don't let me down, 64, oh, come on, here we go, okay, this is a ridiculous limit cycle, but the limit cycle showed that the actual mathematical logic was correct, just the initial conditions were crazy, and as you can see, it's fairly easily linked to the idea of waste output in kilos per year, which of course accumulates in the biosphere, and then atmospheric pollution, where we've also got decay of carbon dioxide turning up there. I'll just make that larger. I forgot to make the make the whole presentation larger on the screen there. But this is now a realistic in in, in an unrealistic world. It's a realistic model of a production of a simple commodity system with both um, energy input and material input. I'll just actually stop running that down and get back to the slides. So it's logically consistent. It's derived from first principles, both in terms of energy and matter, and also macroeconomic definitions. It shows that you must have non-produced inputs to produce output, that waste must occur, and you must have energy to produce output. Now, there's plenty of obvious required extensions that are necessary here. If we've only got a single commodity model, we should have a multiple commodity model with multiple forms of physical waste as well. We need price and quantity buffers ultimately to enable us to reverse that relationship of yields because of course at some point, as we're seeing with the declining quality of mineral yields and declining energy return and energy invested, it's the yield of manufacturing that adjusts to what's happening with the minerals and energy, not the other way around. We need a financial sector like my extension of the Goodwin model. <coughs> and in terms of a theory of value now, this is an energy, dated energy version of Schraffer. So there's lots and lots and lots that can be done overall, but the ultimate objective of this is to get a biophysical monetary model of capitalism, which is what we should have had in the first place. Now, I started off by blaming Nordhaus for the garbage, and frankly, that's all that can be described as the garbage that neoclassical economists have done on climate change. But are they really to blame? I can blame him. I can blame Solo. I can blame Ramsey. I can have a go at Cobb and Douglas. But are they really responsible? I reckon not. I think I should blame this guy, Adam Smith. The simple reason that when you look at how he started the wealth of nations, I've emphasized what he said was the essential input to production, the annual labor of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniences of life, which it annually consumes. Notice the date, 1776. If you go back in history a bit, you find this guy, Richard Candelon, and this is what he wrote in 1755. Land is the source of matter, or matter from which all wealth is drawn. 
Mayan's labor provides the form for its production and wealth in itself is nothing but the food, conveniences and pleasures of life. Am I calling Adam Smith a plagiarist? Yes. And I'm also saying he got made a fundamental mistake that's got us caught in the value wars for the last 250 years. We've wasted all this time and we've ignored energy through the whole process. If we'd started with the, with the physiocrats and not been distracted for one quarter of a millennium by Smith, we would not necessarily produce the garbage that we've produced on climate change today. And I'll just stop that chair. So. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephen, for a very uh, stimulating uh, presentation. And I'm sure we'll have lots of uh, uh, discussion and, and, and questions. Um, maybe just to just to kick things off, uh, a few quick comments and, and, and questions for me, and then I'll turn it over to the to the floor. Um, uh, well, first, uh, I, I couldn't agree more that <clears throat> energy and more largely these you know biophysical uh, inputs and, and outputs of waste have been a huge blind spot uh, for uh, for economics. You reminded me of there was an uh, in, in, in interview many years ago between uh, Herman Daly and, and Bob Solo. Uh, where Daly was pointing this out, and Solo just literally didn't get the question. Yeah, um, he, you know, and and Daly at one point pointed out that you know the standard uh, neoclassical <clears throat> production function can go to infinity, um, yet we can't have an, eco an infinite economy, and so this just you know makes makes no sense. And and again, Solo just didn't understand it. Mm. Um, now. Um, a question for you. One um, thinker on this, who I'm surprised you didn't mention, um, is uh, Nicholas Georgesco Roja. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, who uh, actually started life as a neoclassical economist. Um, uh, I think he was a student of Samuelson, if I remember correctly. Oh, that's correct. Yeah. And, and um, you know, he wrote a, you know, brilliant book uh, about all this and, and uh, you know, uh, and helped kick off a lot of ecological economics. And in that book, uh, again, if I recall, he had an interesting model, not that not a million miles from what you're talking about. You know, he, he uses an input output function. Mm. Uh, he, he it's a stock flow model. Um, now, it's been years since I've looked at it, but, uh, you know, and I know there's been some more modern work along those lines from Bob Ayers and, and some others. Mm. Um, but, you know, wonder if, um, you know, if, if, if your model uh, connects to that uh, that stream of work out of ecological economics. Oh, it definitely does. I mean, for that actual, um, that line, labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy sculpture, literally occurred to me walking through Bob Ayers' flat in Paris. Okay. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever visit Bob in Paris when he was I, living I there? He's visited us here in Oxford. Pardon? Okay, okay. Well, Bob's house is just full of sculptures. And quite literally, I mean, we were you know, discussing how do we build a model where energy plays an essential role, and I didn't, his Linux model, for example, if you know the Linux work he's done mm -hmm. with, um, I forgot, with Kumil, uh, was very good, but it's still at some point it, it produced the Cobb Douglas production function to a three input system in ratios. Okay. Uh, so the same odd lemma was still there. So I was, wasn't happy with it. We were discussing this. I was staying there for a week or two at the time. I went to the bathroom and came back walking, and I walked, his house is full of sculptures, including he's even got one of the original clocks. Uh, the the you near know, the nautical clocks that were used to enable the uh, working out longitude for boats traveling away from the England, which was the reasoning it became the dominant maritime power. And literally, the thought occurred to me: labor without energy is a corpse; capital without energy is a sculpture. Looking at one of those sculptures, so I definitely connect with that literature. And Bob and I wrote that paper together in two thousand and nineteen on the role, note on the role of energy in production, uh, but. In each of them, when I look at George Esco Rogan's work, as well as Bob's, you still had this treatment of energy as the third factor, third input, right. and that's wrong. And yep. it's so simple. You just make, like when, I, when I sat down and did it in, in, the, in the spare bedroom in Bob's house, in 10 minutes, I had the result. Mm -hmm. I went, is that all? It's just that's why has nobody else seen this? Never know. Um, um, also, uh, um... Uh, it'd be interesting to look at uh, some of the work by people who uh, do, doing work in ecological economics on social metabolism, mm. um, where they've tried to empirically measure some of these relationships, you know, energy flows through economies over long periods of time and so on. It'd be interesting mm. to look at 
that data from the perspective of your model. Now let's- uh, so, I, mean, I might drive Kerry on that. I'm gonna get Kerry to answer that question rather than me because he's done far yeah. more of that work than I have, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so um, I, I already see some hands up. Uh, I'll go to you, Nigel, and then anyone else uh, just can raise your, raise your hand. Yeah, hi. Um, so I have, I have a couple of things I wanted to ask about. I mean, one was you've already just uh, sort of answered it a little bit. I was wondering um, how aware you were of, of um, work by as and so on. Obviously, I didn't realize you'd published with it. Mm. But um, I don't know if you are, if you know. There's been there's been work by non-economists that are in is very much down the same line. Mm. Um, where, um, and this is sort of physicists and engineers and so on, um, who are who, who are taking a very non-economics mm. view of the economy and basically regarding it as a physical, a biophysical system yep. for production and consumption. Um, and I don't know if I, I'm not sure if it would be. I think it might be sort of interesting work for you to just be aware of because it might provide a nuance on what you're doing that um, you know could be helpful so I, I can send you some links for some of that I mean, yeah that I mean that'd be appreciated I mean one of the people is probably Tom Tim Garrett I imagine uh no I'm I mean the, well the people I've worked with are um uh um Simon Roberts at, uh, and James Slesser and Mal uh, J James King and Malcolm Slesser up in mm -hmm. Edinburgh um, you know who were doing this stuff back in the and the eighties, okay. um, no. and and they and they were using you know using system dynamics models, yeah, uh, and uh, you know sort of uh, productivity of um, of labor and capital and various sort of production ratios to model economies. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, but, I'll send I'll send you links. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, there are certain people doing this uh, now, and there's a whole tradition and a bunch of physicists trying to get muscled in on economics quite aggressively, which I'm actually very pleased by. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to think of the name of the one of the leading physicists, Tom, and I can't think of his last name. It's really frustrating me a bit, a bit late at night. Uh, but Tom, who wrote the post, have you ever seen the post called Finite Physicists Meets Exponential Economist? <laughs> no, but... <laughs> he's the author of that post, yeah. yeah. And he's now thing called, he's called, thing called uh, Plan, a group called Planetary Limits which is a network of academics. Uh, pardon? Tom Murphy. Tom Murphy, thank you, thank you. Very. Yeah, so Tom Murphy has put that together and that's physicists trying to come and see what economists should have done uh, and also attacking what neoclassical economists have done. So yes, the physicists are coming yeah. and I'm definitely on their side. I very much appreciate those references. Okay, and the, the other thing was, um, what is the role of in, in all of this of the financial side of the economy because um, you know, while the physical, the biophysical economy has these resource limits and, uh, you know, depletion issues and so on, um, mm. the financial economy is just a complete social invention that has actually no, uh, you know, it's just numbers in a machine. You know, it doesn't actually have any limits, right? So um, how, does, how does it relate to all of this? Well, that's, 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 I showed you my Minsky software a moment ago, and I developed Minsky for specifically for monetary modeling. So um, I was going to try to bring up a, a Minsky model and show it to you right now. Um, um, so I'd really appreciate people have given it a try. If you want to take a look at it, it's an open source program. But that, those models I was showing you a moment ago, and this is, this is another Minsky model here, uh, which is a, a simple model of a, a financial sector. So this is all enabling monetary modeling as well. So uh, what I've got on here, I don't know which one I brought up here, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, a mixed model of credit creation and, and fiat money creation. So we do need to do both. And Minsky itself was designed to support uh, both biophysical modeling and financial modeling. So uh, I, I would be, again, very pleased to have people check it out. Uh, you can find it on SourceForge and yeah. uh, download a copy and have a look. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, uh, we've got uh, Kerry next, who is also uh, very kindly posted in the chat a, a paper that he's uh, recently published on this area. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Kerry. Yeah, so that was 
uh, it's my second kind of updated one, but I, in some sense, uh, not quite sitting in Bob Ayer's apartments when I met, uh, or was sitting in theirs when I met Steve Keen. So I was trying to make my first model of uh, a biophysical model and then put in the basics of a bank or a monetary system. Mm -hmm. And then I met Steve and he had that. He's like, oh, okay, I'll just take what <laughs> Steve's doing and add it to my simple biophysical model. But to, uh, I think Eric's uh, question or to uh, uh, Nigel just speaking, I, I'd love your input on the, on the paper I linked there because I think it speaks a lot to what you were just saying. And I'm also not familiar with that other work. So appreciate a link to that. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a long-term modeling approach. I, I link biophysical principles and an input output framework to sort of the, uh, the, the financial modeling that Steve has with the banks lending money to, to firms to invest in capital. And so I can track debt and wages and, and relate it to resource consumption rates. Um, and I think it has insights for um, at least globally, when you look at the global data, the shift from kind of a constant energy intensity until the 1970s and then afterwards uh, declining energy intensity. And this kind of shift happens when resource uh, consumption rates get close to stagnating uh, in total or per person. Um, and I think there's also some insights there into the pressure on wages after the 1970s to, to decline. And so I'd love for feedback on that or the uh, chance to present, but I, I think it kind of shows why there might've been pressure to lower, you know, wage bargaining power, if you will. I sort of explore that a little bit in principle, um, if you're not increasing the rate of resource consumption, which in my model is generically physical resources and energy at this point, but of course, continue to work on updating it uh, in current projects. So. And, and uh, Tony's linked Tom Murphy's uh, free book, by the way, which I highly recommend, uh, an incredibly comprehensive uh, book of a, a biophysical approach to human civilization. Okay, next, other, I think we... Other questions, comments? Matthew's got one, I think. Yeah. yeah, I feel kind of brave after seeing all those equations asking a question. <laughs> um, but, and hopefully this is not too uh, too simple and too stupid, but what what is your intuition as to what would happen uh, given that you've got energy explicitly in the model and in a correct format in your mind would what would happen if we were managed to uh, halve our costs of energy well i think that's a very hypothetical question it's not going to happen <laughs> like energy costs are going to go up rather than down um well, but if you, you did you'd have, you'd, well i'll give you explain but if you did get what you're talking about you'd have a you'd have a uh you know, I've lost my train of thought shortly there. But if you, if you did have the sort of drop you're talking about, you'd have a dramatic increase in the rate of profit. Because fundamentally, uh, what you get out of this, which is the physiocratic argument, is that the profit is what they used to call the free gift of labor of nature. So if it gets you, if it's cheaper to extract the free gift of nature, then you have a higher rate of profit and a higher rate of return. And you have struggles over the distribution of that energy as well as part of your your production system. But in terms of the cost of energy, it's going to go up. And several reasons for that. First of all, is what's called the energy return and energy invested, which is actually part of my model there. Uh, that in, in empirical world is declining and declining quite rapidly. Uh, we used to get an energy return and energy invested back in the days of uh, the early oil industry, where one, one you know, unit of energy in got you over 100 units of energy out. Now we're talking about if you're lucky, in that industry, one unit in giving you 12 out. And there are strong arguments coming out of Charlie Hall's work, who's another person that I uh, should have mentioned earlier. Charlie Hall's work on energy return and energy investing, he's the person who moved into that term. He said, below five or seven to one, you can't maintain a civilized society. So we're now, uh, we've gone from 100 to one to maybe 15 to one. And at five to one or seven to one, we lose the capacity to hold together an advanced civilization. So uh, that, that alone is the decline in fossil fuels. At the other end, there are all sorts of disputes over how you measure the energy return, return and energy invested for wind and solar and so on. But they are seen as starting below that level and coming up. I'm actually, I'm a bit skeptical about some of the negative stats I've seen on energy return and energy invested for solar and wind. I think it's higher than is implied. A lot of the lower results come out of the idea of us recycling everything. We never recycle mines. Why should we talk about recycling uh, solar cells and, and wind, wind farms? But nonetheless, we do have a real crunch coming our way in terms of the energy needed to sustain an advanced civilization. And then there's excellent work by 
and actually a, a Stragum ex mining engineer called Simon Meicher, M-I-C-H-A-U-X. I'll put his name in the chat down here. And Simon has done a very detailed uh, study of the availability of the minerals we need to have a non-fossil fuel-based industry. And he says we're about, only about 10% effectively of the minerals we need actually exist. So we're facing an energy crunch because of the energy crunch, the cost of energy is going to become much higher. Uh, because without it, you can't do anything. So the income struggle will be over who gets energy. So we're going to see more expensive energy, not cheaper. Now, I think, I think um, Stephen, uh, well, we could probably have a whole other seminar on that subject. I think uh, mm. many of us in our group here would actually have a very different view uh, on, on that line of argument. Um, uh, that in our group, we've done a lot of empirical research on energy costs and basically find that you know, fossil fuel costs have been essentially a random walk since the late 1800s and um, renewable technologies have been on uh, exponential uh, cost declines, uh, um, uh, rights law uh, cost declines, um, and um, uh, also uh, with another group I've been looking into the mineral situation and in finding um, you know, uh, actually few constraints on that and, and huge increases in the productivity of mineral usage in um, renewable energy uh, generation. So we actually have a different view that the clean energy economy is likely to result in lower energy costs uh, than mm -hmm. the uh, fossil fuel economy for some pretty fundamental uh, technological uh, reasons. And so- well, that's, if I no, just interrupt you, just uh, interrupt you uh, mate, that, that is actually a good idea for a good seminar. Yeah. I'm intrigued by that. So if you get Simon together with your Argentinian yeah. colleague, that could be a very interesting discussion. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and you know, just on, on your point about, um, you know, Nordhaus's estimates, uh, you know, so we see that, you know, the real, the, we agree with you, the absurdity of the, of the Nordhaus uh, damage functions, you know, as I put in the chat, he's basically saying, you know, apocryphal climate change is not as bad as COVID was um, uh, in terms of scales of impact. But you know the, the real damage from that is less likely to be a, a massive reduction in energy availability and more a massive uh, inability to organize human activity, more the, exactly. collapse, the collapse of civilization rather than a lack of energy. Totally agree there. And I mean, we actually, we, we, I think we're starting to see those climate effects now. The scale of uh, climate disturbances. I, I, I'm actually giving another talk in a, in a day's time. But one of my illustrations is a McDonald's and one photograph of McDonald's last week, and there's McDonald's this week, and the, the, the sign from McDonald's is 15 metres above the ground, and in the second one, it's one metre above the water. Uh, so we're going to see incredible disruption to human civilization, courtesy of climate chaos. I think that's the main gift that Norton House has given us. And, and uh, I'm just looking for if, if any other, anybody else wants to raise a hand for comments or questions while, while we're waiting. Um, you wrote a you wrote a, a quite a scathing piece in the conversation. I think it was was it back last year or the year before uh, critiquing yep. the Nordhaus model, um, uh, which again I think quite rightly. Uh, did you get any reaction from that? <laughs> I got a funny one. I'll, I'll copy the the the, pa the the paper itself that that's based on. I've just copied that to the chat, and um, that got incredible coverage on Twitter and didn't penetrate the media at all, which really pissed me off completely. I thought the conversation piece would have quite an impact upon media. It ended up in a couple of obscure Israeli newspapers and things like that. So it's partly a sign, I think, of the journal that I published in not being you know, a five-star journal, so it didn't get the media coverage it should have got. Um, but funnily enough, students from the Rethinking Group tried to organise a debate with me and Nordhaus. <laughs> and uh, I think there was somebody either Oxford or Cambridge, I'm not sure which one of the two, ran Nordhaus, and Nordhaus hung up on him and then blocked his number. Yeah, uh, that's that's academic engagement, I guess. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, but uh, in, in, in that, no one has tried to seriously, you know, engage with that paper or defend, uh, you know, uh, Toll or Nordhaus or any of those guys. They, they, yeah, they're in a strange sort of way they do. And they, they, what, what, what Nordhaus did is indefensible. I mean, assuming 87% of the industry will be unaffected because it happens in carefully controlled environments and then putting all of manufacturing, all of mining, 
crazily enough, all of services, because it has a roof over it, is just insane. And that's indefensible. Now, we wrote a critique of that for the proceedings of the Royal, proceedings of the Royal Society, and that was rejected by neoclassical referees who said, nothing like that could ever get published today. That's old hat. We've gone well on from that. That's why I started with those three papers from 2021, showing they're getting exactly the same bloody numbers. And what they've done instead is, rather than doing the crap that Nordhaus did, where you assume a roof will protect you, and you also use, use correlations between today's GDP and today's temperature, now what they do is say, oh, we're going to take the period from 1960 to 2017 and see what happened to energy, temperature and GDP across that period. And then we're just going to extrapolate that forward for the next 80 years. Linear extrapolation. That's the Khan and Mahati's paper. I mean, Kamiya Mahat is a lovely guy. I really quite like him. But that's good. What's garbage? You're going to extrapolate and say there's no change in the structure of the climate for the next 80 years? Nonsense. And uh, then out comes Dietz and Wagner and co. And they talk about um, tipping points and say that, I mean, this, again, they use, they use quadratics to extrapolate what's happening in the data. Now, I'm sorry, quadratic does not give you a tipping point. So that is insane. And again, they, they end up saying that, uh, you know, if, we, if, if this, is the, this is the craziness of it, if we lose the Arctic, Greenland, West Antarctic, the Amazon, uh, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, the Gulf Stream, effectively, uh, permafrost and ocean methane hydrates, we will lose 1.4% of GDP. We will not, we will lose the planet. It'll be a totally different environment. And the fact that this got put through referees shows us how really congenitally insane that little branch of neoclassical economics is. So there is no defence. So the defences they have used can be blown out of the water by their most recent research. I really think it's criminal. I'm going to be honest. I think this is there is a crime in, in law called negligence. And this, to me, given the, the impact this will have upon human society and indeed life on the planet, this is criminally negligent work. Well, we're um, uh, some of us and in, in, in colleagues and in some other institutions are engaged in, in effort. We're, we're hoping to actually have a big redo of, of these damage functions from a, and do it from a biophysical uh, basis, uh, not from mm -hmm. these uh, absurd uh, assumptions, because we agree it's, it's uh, Da not just ludicrous, it's, it's dangerous. Mm. Um, any other, uh, anyone else want to come in with a comment or question or uh, uh, Paul Price? Uh, hello, Steve. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Uh, it's great, yeah. great to see you, great to listen to you. And uh, just coming, I, I, I work on climate research in climate science and policy. And I have to say, this has been coming for a long time, but it's really taken economists with uh, your your understanding of e economics, if you like, and, and getting to grips with the way that economists approach things to face up to the, what's happened. Yeah. And I'm certainly I, I, I and others like me are hugely appreciative of what you've done. Okay. And I think I think we should encourage all economists to kind of pay some attention here, because this is, as you, as you have described, catastrophic. Um, failure in, in, in a whole branch of, of um, well, I, I can't call it science, but uh, it's no. been desperate. And so I, I certainly encourage anybody here and anyone who's working on economics to be kind of uh, paying attention to what Steve's been doing. And, and certainly I'm planning to use Minsky in my, if I can <laughs> get to grips with it, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm an expert, but, uh, but certainly what Steve has done, I find hugely helpful in, in understanding things. So that's a, that's a big vote of thanks from me for, for all you've worked on. And it's really, really having that economic, that understanding of neoclassical economics and applying it. Yeah. One thing I have to report, I just said it quickly in, the, in there, and I, I, I th I'm not sure if you ever got the chance, I never did get the chance to look at the uh, working group two, which is where Richard Toll and, and Co are. Yeah. Um, but it's it's there again, and uh, I I find it very disappointing. I have to say to read an IPCC document where this has happened again without any kind of understanding beyond beyond, but you know, along the lines of what you've been talking about. I know, and it's it's tragic because if if you look at the work they've done, there's no way anybody other than a bunch of neoclassical referees would have let this stuff get published. Because to simply assume a roof will protect you from climate change, I'm sorry, you don't understand what climate change is. Your paper should not be published. That should be the response of any scientist looking at the assumptions 
neoclassicals have made. And I think the only reason it got through is neoclassicals have fooled themselves, assumptions don't matter. Okay, which is nonsense, it's methodological garbage, but that's the defense of ridiculous assumptions that neoclassical got used to. And once you had your mind softened to accept things like perfect competition, perfect foresight, blah, 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 you can actually let, let's assume a roof objective from climate change pass through as a simplifying assumption. And that ends up on the horror we're seeing now. And it, I, th I think at some point people are gonna look back and say, how on earth did we not see this coming? And the large amount of the answer will be because economists pulled the wool over their eyes and ours. Thanks very much. Uh, just, just to add, I, I, only because of your work, I was able to go to our kind of in Ireland here, go to our <laughs> national kind of um, economics group who, who do the stuff with the government and look at the equation that they've got that drives their understanding and you can have no energy in that equation and have an economy. I know. Only, yeah. only because, I, but worse than that, of course, and I'm looking at energy and climate change, is that all of the energy modeling assumes that modeling. Exactly. It's based on yeah. assuming that. And so you've got nonsense as the basis for all of our energy modeling, which is supposed to be addressing our climate modeling. Well, this is craziness. It is, <laughs> so we unfortunately. We need to turn things around somehow. I don't know how that happens, but- Well, the trouble, what worry, I mean, I, I wish I'd seen this stuff 20 years ago because I, I think I would have been just as outraged 20 years ago as I was when I first read it in 2018. <laughs> or we, you know, th look, but no, this stuff passed through. I mean, there've been plenty of people to critique, criticize it before. I'm certainly not the first person to criticize neoclassical climate change work. But if you read Pindic and De Carnio, uh and I've forgotten the, one of the other people who have been involved as well. They didn't have a look at the, they didn't attack the, um, the assumptions. Paper. They yeah. attacked the, the shape of the damage function, the fact that your quadratic was being used, um, the extrapolations and so on, but they didn't actually look at the assumptions. Why on earth not? That's what's just unconscious that I'm the first person to actually publicize how insanely bad those physical assumptions are and how much the work depends upon those assumptions as being correct when they're manifestly false. Yeah, thanks very much. It's a house of cards. <laughs> it is. Yeah, we're living in it, unfortunately. It, it, yeah. it, it, it is indeed. Um, well, we're at the end of our time. Um, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, just to, just to sum up, um, uh, the laws of economics do not trump the laws of physics. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, following what Steve has done, it's, it's vital that we uh, learn how to model the economy as embedded in this larger biophysical system. And that's the only way we'll be able to understand uh, these, these, uh, these critical issues. So uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for giving us that very stimulating seminar. Uh, um, uh, we'll look forward to more work to come on this. Uh, and this will be an ongoing, this is an ongoing theme uh, for the INET Center. So very much looking forward to continuing to engage with, uh, with everyone on these issues. So let me just give a, a round of applause uh, uh, to Steve uh, virtually. Thank you. And, and I do look forward to seeing back for that. Uh, let's have a seminar with Simon and your Argentinian colleague. It would be uh, a great little follow up to this. So we, uh, let's get biophysical, as they used to say. In the, oh, let's in get the biophysical. Movies. Excellent. I love that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.